a lot of us are thinking about old legacy institutions and about startups and about what invigorates this country and allows it to renew itself and uh, manages to keep us in a position of leadership. And I, I think a lot about beginnings because very often when we look at old institutions, we don't realize how scrappy they were, how much heart and soul that they had at the beginning in order to catalyze and sort of self-catalyze this process where they get to be durable institutions. In general, they're started because there is some need that is going unmet. And uh, knowing what that need is and knowing how to seize the moment is what allows uh, us to become part of something romantic that people talk about at some point, hopefully, in the future. And in a situation like this, um, I sometimes ask myself, why are we here? What does this school do that's different than all the other great schools in the city? And I think that one of the things is, is that if you look at education, one of the things that I found very striking when we toured schools is many of them said, we teach students to think like researchers. We teach math classes from the perspective of wanting your children to think like a mathematician. And this was odd to me because I was a mathematician and I wasn't necessarily able to get that sort of a, a relationship from, from many of these schools. So what happens when you actually bring the people who are at the forefront of research, maybe the world leaders, and you try to get them interested in a uh, primary uh, and uh, secondary education? And I think that one of the interesting things is, is that we haven't really tried very hard to get the world's greatest researchers to take an interest in some of the, uh, the world's greatest children and the world's greatest schools. So I, I was very lucky uh, that I happened to be in graduate school at Harvard at just the moment that the Soviet Union uh, was in the process of transitioning. And Harvard, with the poll that it had at the time, had its pick of one of the finest mathematical communities uh, anywhere on the planet and one with an extremely different, rich tradition. And effectively, almost the first person that they pulled out of Russia uh, to come to Harvard was Ed Frankel, who at the time was only 21. And his research was so well thought of that they immediately made him uh, a visiting professor. That was until they realized their error, that he didn't even have a PhD. Uh, and so, for, for clerical reasons, Ed was sent back uh, to the minors for the absolute minimal length of time possible. One year, raced through a PhD and was back on top. Uh, and his, his rise has been uh, nothing sh short of meteoric. Uh, winner, first, I think the inaugural winner of the Herman Weil Prize, a uh, member of the Society of Fellows, and a professor at California uh, Berkeley, University of California Berkeley. Uh, Ed is one of the leaders in a field that has been called uh, the unifying theme in mathematics of Langland's theory, sometimes uh, to provide a counterweight to unification in theoretical physics. Uh, so Ed is drawing from all across algebra, geometry, analysis, the traditional fields, as well as uh, collaborating with the very leaders of theoretical physics today. Um, and what was very interesting is that when we asked Ed, would you, would you be an advisor to the Spire School, uh, there wasn't a nanosecond before he said, absolutely. And so it's amazing to be able to bring somebody at the height of their powers uh, who is interested as much in research as in outreach. And you know, I was making a remark recently that if you know anybody who's done any modeling, people very frequently will use the term supermodel indiscriminately, as if every model is a supermodel. Likewise, if you know anybody who's got a math PhD, very often they are informally referred to as a math genius. But among mathematicians, we use the term very hesitatingly and very sparingly, and I consider Ed to be a true math genius, even from the perspective of PhDs. He's got uh, a passion uh, and a vision that's matched by very few in our field, and we just spent the most wonderful day with your children in this school. And we were trying to throw all sorts of stuff that is normally reserved for graduate study, uh, from abstract algebra to topology. Not only do the kids know some of the stuff, they're able to figure it uh, out on the fly, teach each other. They are so ready and they are so primed. I want to see if we can get one clip uh, that we have stored up um, of a student who is here. Where is Andrew? Andrew, can you do me a favor? I don't know if you're tall enough, but can you just 
Bring yourself up above the crowd. Stand on a chair. <laughs> All right. Andrew was asked, yeah. is this loaded up? It is. Terrific. So a lot, of, a lot of these kids were asked the question about what is math, and we got such amazing answers. Math is where you have fun solving problems. All problems have solutions, but different ways to solve them. Math is basically a fun land to be in. Math is creative thinking. It's a treasure chest locked away deep in the mind with endless possibilities to unlock. Math is not only the problems that students labor over from first grade till college. No, math is much more. Math is the very existence of life. All is number was the famous motto uh, chosen by Pythagoras. This was chosen for a reason. If someone thought to work out the equation, the universe minus math equals question mark, well, that's easy. All that is left is the idea of nothing. I mean, can you imagine this? So maybe we can have Andrew uh, in his clip tell us a little bit about how he sees math. All right. What I like about math is that it really um, excites the mind, and it's really gives you powers of concentration, and it changes sometimes self-consciousness for self-confidence. Yeah. Very, very great for public speaking and doing mathematical work. It's easy to work with, and it's, it's fun. <laughs> So we, we tried to move graduate school into fourth, fifth, and sixth grades today. We had a blast doing it. And I want to make sure that you guys get a chance to have some of the fun that we did. So without further ado, let me introduce the beast from the east, Fast Eddie Frankel, to talk to us about <laughs> his new book, Love and Math, what it means for uh, outreach and education, and an entirely new perspective on a subject that many of you thought you knew, but hopefully after tonight, you may see from a different light. Uh, thank you, Eric, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, Eric and I go way back. Um, have known each other for a long time. And uh, Eric is, uh, is really, um, if I want, if I, when I describe Eric to uh, friends, I, the best way I, I know to describe him is a, a true Renaissance man. And uh, he's really done amazing work in, in finance and economics, and more recently in, uh, uh, presented his ideas at Oxford University on a, about a new theory of everything, the grand unified theory of physics, um, trying to correct some of, the, some of the problems which we have right now in theoretical physics, in, uh, both in a standard model and uh, Einstein's relativity theory. So it's really a great pleasure uh, to have him as a dear friend. And, and also, uh, I want to thank him for introducing me to Spire family. And I'm so proud to be a member of this family because you guys are doing just such an incredible job um, working with talented kids, with advanced learners, and this is so important, and I'm really happy and proud to be part of it and to help you in every way I can to, to really, you know, help our, our children, our next generation, you know, to, to make them our thought leaders and uh, to, to give them the knowledge and the tools that they need in this brave new world that we live in. So, indeed, we spent a few hours today with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and I must say, this was probably the most terrifying presentation that I was preparing <laughs> in the last few years. It was certainly much harder than speaking at Harvard or Princeton, because, not because I, was, I thought that they were not ready uh, for, for, for me and for Eric, but I, I was afraid I was, we were not ready for them. And indeed, we were, I was very impressed how fast and, and, and smart and just amazing they were and how brilliant. And this, this curiosity and passion that I saw in their eyes, I, I just think that the main thing that we should focus on is how to preserve this curiosity and this passion, how to feed on this, and how to you know, open the doors for them so that they could get the best education they can. And so I wanted to talk a little bit to you about how I see uh, things about how I see math education uh, for the 21st century. I, I think that um, many of the things that are being done right now at our schools um, does not allow our children to get exposed to this you know, magic universe of mathematics. So I want to talk about mathematics as really as a new way of thinking. And so I want to start by, by, by quoting from this, uh, reading a couple of quotes. Homeland Security uh, Newswire says that 
U.S. educational system does not help gifted students reach their full potential, which is very unfortunate and a big problem. And uh, the New York Times actually devoted not one, not two, but three uh, editorials back in December to the problems of math education in this country. And one of the articles that they wrote was uh, entitled something like, uh, gifted students are increasingly forced to, to tend for themselves. And, uh, and it's a very state, uh, a kind of a sorry state of affairs that they say not only do average American students perform poorly compared to those in other countries, but so do the best students. Languishing in the middle of the pack as measured by leading international comparisons. And that's really an untenable situation. We have to do something about it. And um, so mathematics is, is where this is especially true. And uh, uh, for the United States to remain competitive on the, on the world arena, we, we have to inform the way we teach mathematics. And uh, especially we have to pay attention how this is taught to, to the talented students who are our future intellectual leaders. An, ar an argument often is, is made that we don't need mathematics. Um, or very few of us actually ever get to do some stuff that we learn at school and in, in, in our mathematical classes. And I, I want to give a kind of a short answer to that. And then I will expound on that, expand on this. So in this brave new world in which we live in, I would say, um, abstraction is king. And I think it's, it's really, we have entered this world of abstraction where a lot of things that maybe, you know, my generation or previous generations were, could sort of get by without mathematics. Now it's becoming virtually impossible to be able to navigate this complicated, complex world of abstraction without using mathematics. And that's because math is really the key to abstraction. And that, I would say, is the first, the number one reason why we have to give our children quality math education. So to give you just a simple example, um, you know, we, we, uh, what, what really distinguishes us from cavemen is you know, the level of traction that we can reach. In the old days, all trade was done by barter, so you would exchange fish for, for grain. But then, of course, humans invented money, and that's the first level of abstraction, where suddenly you have this piece of paper which carries some wealth. Well, it's not fish, it's not grain, and yet you can use it to exchange things. So that's already first level of abstraction. But we have gone much further than that, right? I mean, these days, for, without using cash you know, money anymore, I'm just carrying this plastic thing with me, and it allows me to buy things and, and trade things and so on. And, and oftentimes, money even appears, doesn't even appear in the form of any physical object. It just appears as a line on the computer screen, or as, a, as one might say, as a, as, a, as a line of code in a Bitcoin ledger, right? So that's even higher level of abstraction. How can we possibly understand all this stuff without using mathematics? So. For our, for our students to be able to navigate their way in this new world, they have to gain proficiency in abstraction. And uh, I want to I leave you with this. I wanna, if you, there's only one thing you, want, you will remember from my talk. I want to, you to remember this, this formula. I promise it's only, there's only be one form, there'll only be one formula. Uh, proficiency with, with abstraction, I think, is really mathematical knowledge plus conceptual thinking multiplied by logical reasoning. That's what it is. And, Mathematical knowledge, conceptual thinking, and logical reasoning are the, are the, the three uh, you know, main uh, foundations of, of mathematics. And that's how we should teach mathematics at schools. And this brings up, of course, the question of what is mathematics really? Because um, I think we have misconceptions about mathematics. Mathematics is, I think, crucial, but also the most misunderstood subject. So what I want to talk about is the fact that mathematics is really about concepts and ideas. It's not just about numbers. And the, a very interesting aspect of mathematics is that mathematical truths are objective and timeless and persistent and necessary. And they mean the same thing to everyone everywhere in the world. And that is the beauty and power of mathematical knowledge, which actually makes mathematics, if you think about it, the last honest science. We can disagree on so many different things, but there is one thing that we can agree on. Two plus two equals four, right? If we do it correctly, if we calculate correctly. 
Actually, I'll talk about clock arithmetic, where this might not be true uh, necessarily, depending on how you do it. But um, if you just work with natural numbers, with whole numbers, and you add two and two, you'll get four. And we all agree on this. In other words, once we convert our ideas and, and uh, you know, uh, measure things, convert them into math, we can all agree on this. There, is no, there are no different interpretations. There is no room for authority for saying, I'm bigger than you, I'm, sm I'm older than you. Uh, actually, today we, we talked to the kids about this. And I asked them, um, you know, I asked some question about, which, which um, uh, will come up later, and I asked them, I took a vote. So who thinks this way? They raised their hands, who thinks this way? And I said, well, in a democracy, we would say that, you know, the, the, the position which got more votes wins, and that's it, case closed. But that's not how we, do in mathematics, how we do it in mathematics. And in fact, ironically, on some issues, a minority turned out to be right. But then we argued, we, we discussed this. I gave an argument, and all agreed on this. And, and in mathematics, we, always have to, we will always agree on this, because we follow logical rules, we follow logical reasoning, and uh, the results that we arrive at, they, they are universal. They are universal truths, which mean the same thing to everyone. And that's why math is important. Unfortunately, the way mathematics is taught in our schools today is like teaching an art class in which you only teach the students how to paint a fence or a wall, but not showing them the paintings of the great masters. So of course, in, if, you, if you do it this way, then teaching mathematics becomes an intellectual equivalent of watching paint dry, rather than really absorbing and uh, getting inspired by the paintings of the great masters. So we have to unlock this power and beauty of mathematics. We have to show our students those masterpieces which have been locked away. So I want to give you a few examples. What do I mean by this? And, uh, and, and of course, uh, at school, t children have to learn things like multiplication table and, and so on, the, the, kind of, the, the kind of things that are already in the curriculum. I'm not saying that those things should be you know, thrown away. Of course, these are these things are necessary. But there are many concepts of modern mathematics which never find their way to our schools. When I was growing up, I was growing up in the Soviet Union, and the situation with math education was in some ways better than in the United States. And even then, uh, the school curriculum was just as limited as it is here in the United States. And I personally, I have to admit it, I hated mathematics when I was a student. Not more hated maybe is too strong a word, but I didn't like it, I didn't enjoy it, I was not inspired by it. I was good at it, I could, do, I could solve problems, but I did not find it to be interesting and inspiring. And the reason was that I was never, nobody ever told me what mathematics was really about. All I knew was how to paint the fence, but not the paintings of the great masters. And so I was lucky, the last year of high school, I met a professional mathematician who opened this magical universe for me, who opened the doors for me, opened the portal, and showed me uh, some of the ideas uh, which I was completely blown away by those ideas. and said, oh, that's what mathematics is about. And that's what I think we should do in, uh, in our schools, especially in an in a a, in, you know, inspiring place like Spire Legacy School, where we have such wonderful teachers and such a great opportunity to allow our children to see the world for what it is through the lens of mathematics. And so, so I want to give you a couple of examples of kind of concepts and ideas, which I think, which Okay, until, until today, I could be speaking about it kind of from a theoretical point of view. I could say, these are the ideas that we could teach to our kids. But now I can actually say, yes, we can teach to our kids. Because today, we did talk to our children at Spire Legacy School. And I think that they understood things maybe even better than we do. So in some sense, they were very quick to grasp. You, you agree with me? Lightning fast. Lightning fast. They were, they were um, curious, they were passionate, they were excited, they were inspired by this. So yes, it is possible, and yes, I think we should do that. We should do more of that. So let me give you, let me just throw a few ideas just to show you the kind of things that Eric and I today talk to the students about. Ah, maybe just the general. It's a beautiful picture there. It's a hidden parallel universe full of elegance and beauty inter intertwined with our world. And uh, what, what, what kind of things did we talk about today? Well, we talked about symmetry, for example. And this, this are actually the kind of slide, the, exactly the kind of slides that we were showing to our, to our students today. So see, when people talk about symmetry, they um, you know, give examples of symmetrical objects like a snowflake or, uh, or a butterfly, or um, some might say a human, human body is symmetrical. Here's a famous uh, drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. But what does, it, what does this really mean? And today, I was sort of, I asked students this question. Um, uh, uh, let's look at a round, a round glass like this, 
and a square and a square glass. Well, we don't have a square glass here, but I'll use this Rubik's cube as a, as a substitute. And I ask them, which one is more symmetrical? Which one is more symmetrical? And then that's when we took the vote. And some kids said, uh, said raise your hands. Actually, let's do it, let's do it now. How, ma <laughs> how many of you? <laughs> How many of you think that uh, the round glass is more symmetrical? Please raise your hand. OK. And how many of you think that uh, the square glass is more symmetrical? OK. Just a minority, a minority. But sometimes, like I said, in math, sometimes minority wins. So just because you know, we're not deciding things by plurality, we're not deciding things by authority, let's, let's discuss it. Let's, let's come up with a conclusion that we will all, be, uh, that we will all believe in and we'll all accept as a, as a valid one. Right? So it, it, mathematicians approach it in the following way. We look at this, say, let's look at the round one. And let's think of all possible ways that you can transform this object, do something to this, so that it stays the same. In other words, occupies the same position, doesn't change its shape. And in the case of a round glass, there's a clear um, sort of family of transformations that you can make, namely rotations. Rotations around the, the uh, central, central axis. Contrast that with some, say, moving it here. Then, of course, that changes its position. So that's not allowed. But the rotation around, this, around the central axis actually makes the same thing. It creates, you know, leaves the glass in the, same, in the same position. So in other words, if I turn away and one of you came up and turned it like this, and I look back, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So that's what we call in mathematics a symmetry. And so that means that the symmetries of this round glass are all possible rotations by any angle at all, 30 degrees, 50 degrees, 45 degrees, any angle between 0 and 360 degrees, OK? What about the square object like this, like Rubik's Cube? We had a lot of fun, by the way, playing with Rubik's Cube today, because uh, Eric and I had to admit to our shame that we couldn't, do, we couldn't solve it. And then uh, uh, there were a bunch of kids who just <laughs> <laughs> it was done. And I think it was a good metaphor for actually how much how much more open they are to ideas, how much quicker they are, and how much more capable they are of doing things that maybe we adults are not are kind of like slow and maybe not, not able to do. But OK, so let's look at the square object. What are the transformations of this guy? And I don't mean now, of course, there is sort of like we can rotate and, as a Rubik's Cube, but let's just imagine it as, a, as being a solid object. What kind of things can we do so, uh, so as to preserve its, position, its, its shape and position? Well. Now, it's more restrictive because if I rotate it by an arbitrary angle, like 30 degrees, then I, you, know, you rotate, I turn away, you rotate, I look back, I will know the difference, right? Only if you rotate by 90 degrees and 180 degrees and 270 degrees and 360 that it will stay the same. Then I wouldn't be able to tell. Well, let's not ignore the fact that they're different colors. Let's imagine it's the same color, okay? So, in other words, the transformations of this one, which preserve it, there are only four of them. Rotations by 90, 180, 270, and 360. So there are only four symmetries, whereas this one has infinitely many symmetries. Right? And that's why I would say that this is more symmetrical. Now, it's possible that one could come up with some other context in which this could be viewed as more symmetrical. But in the context of mathematical notion of symmetry, where symmetry is taken as um, defined as a transformation which you know, preserves an object, it's clear that indeed this, this is more symmetrical, has more symmetries. And this actually is a very, uh, it sounds like a very simple observation. Uh, okay, so these are the slides in which I explain the same thing, that, that you really have all the transformations. You can think of them as points on the circle. Every point on the circle gives you a particular rotation because it gives you an angle of the rotation. And that's what those um, symmetries are. And whereas for, um, so that's another slide showing one of those rotations, 30 degrees. Whereas for the square glass, only four, only four rotations are allowed. Only four are, are symmetries. And so the round glass has more symmetries indeed. But we have now arrived an, at an abstract object. Remember I was talking about how mathematics is key to abstraction. And, and, and right, likewise, abstraction is the main method is in mathematics. We started out with concrete objects, a glass, a Rubik's cube or whatever. And, uh, but now we talk about their symmetries. And as we start discussing these symmetries, we come up with an abstract object which doesn't exist in, in, you know, in the world around us. It exists in our imagination. It exists in our mind. And that object is the set of all possible symmetries, which for the round object would be a circle because it would, you know, every point is just an angle. 
But in, and an interesting thing about this abstract object, which I cannot touch, I cannot show it to you, right? I, well, I kind of drew a picture of it, but it's really just a depiction, just a, a drawing. It's really an abstract object, which you know, I'm, it's only in our imagination, in our minds. This abstract object actually services many different round, ob round things, like a glass, but also this round table, right? But a, a round bottle, a round colon, and so on. In fact, being round simply means to have the circle as the group of its symmetries. That's what it means. So, so that's an example of a concept that comes out once you start analyzing things mathematically, once you start looking at things from a mathematical perspective. And so the circle, and we call this a group of symmetries. And it has an interesting structure, which is that we can actually apply symmetries back to back. We can rotate by 30 degrees and then by 20 degrees. The cumulative effect will be 50 degrees. So there is a certain operation we can do. So it's not just a set of points, but there is a lot more to this. We call that in mathematics a group. And this is one of the cornerstones of modern mathematics. Why is it that our children never get to learn this concept? When Eric and I were able to explain this today in uh, to, you know, the fifth and fourth and sixth graders in basically 10, 15 minutes. And they were absolutely uh, <coughs> excited and engaged and found the same concept over and over in multiple systems. It's one of the great mysteries. That's right. The beauty of this is that even though the concept of symmetry, of, group, of a group of symmetry, the way I explained it originated from geometry, right? It originated from analyzing a geometric object and looking at transformations and so on. In fact, groups, groups appear in mathematics in many different guises, in many different areas. And I want to give you another example of, where, of an area where um, uh, groups appear. Ah, so here's one more geometric maybe uh, that you can also look at rot um, symmetries of a sphere. Of a sphere. And uh, lest, you th lest you think that there is sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between symmetries and uh, points of the object itself, because circle looks kind of very similar to the round, to the round object. In the case of a sphere, it becomes more complex <clears throat> because a sphere can be rotated, but you have to choose the axis of rotation. It could be the one going from north to south, but it could be any other axis going through the center. So there are many different many more symmetries, and they're not just determined by the points of the object. It's more complicated than that. But again, that's, geometric, that's a geometric example. And here I want to talk about how um, groups also uh, appear and how um, they help us in other areas of mathematics, which also have applications to the real life. And I want to start by, by showing you this headline from The Guardian about, about National Security Agency. Uh, you know, circumventing some uh, encryption protocols. And I, I don't know how many of you really know uh, what exactly was being done. And actually, it turns out that NSA was using very sophisticated mathematics, which involves groups. So groups are actually now everywhere. Whenever we do, um, whenever we send email messages or uh, send credit card numbers or access our bank accounts, group theory is at play. Different kinds of groups from the groups uh, that we just talked about, which are transformation groups of geometric objects, but groups nonetheless, which have similar, which sort of have similar structure, and from which we can learn so much, and we can, which we can use for good, but sometimes perhaps for ill. So let me just give you a couple of examples of, uh, just give you just of the idea how groups are used in encryption. And to explain this, I want to talk about clock arithmetic. So I said earlier that mathematics is not just about numbers. But of course, numbers are very important in mathematics. But if we start talking about numbers, it's not just the whole, you know, like whole numbers, like natural numbers that we're used to that are important, or real numbers. They are, there are also other numerical systems which are just as important and exciting. One of them is the numerical system of clock arithmetic. So, and to illustrate that, let's just look at this very simple example. If you start working at 9 o'clock in the morning and you work for eight hours, when do you finish? Well, naively, you would say, the first approach would be to say, well, 9 plus 8 is 17. So uh, you should say 17 o'clock. But we don't say 17 o'clock. We say 5 o'clock. Actually, in France, it would be perfectly normal to say 17 o'clock. But maybe, maybe I should correct myself. That wouldn't be perfectly normal, because in France, uh, the workday is limited to seven hours. <laughs> But if it were eight hours, then we could say seven, we finish at 17 o'clock. But in the United States, we say 5, 5 p.m. I finish at 5 p.m. So why do we say that? Well, 9 plus 8 is 17, but then we subtract 12. 
17 is greater than 12, and we don't want to consider numbers greater than 12. So whenever we go you know, beyond 12, we just subtract 12 and take the remainder. In this case, it's 5. Right? So 9 plus 5, we'll say, is 9 plus 8 is 5 modulo 12. So this is what mathematicians call a modular arithmetic or clock arithmetic. And you don't have to do it modulo 12. You can also do it modulo any number, right? I mean, in other words, you can imagine a clock which has you know, 5 hours, 7 hours, 264 hours. So here's a clock which has 7 hours. So that means that 0 and 7 and 14 will correspond to this position, and 1 and 8 and 15 will correspond to this position, and so on. So there are only seven possibilities. And we can, we can add and subtract these numbers by using this rule that whenever you go above 7, you just take the remainder. Which, by the way, uh, uh, 7 is, is a, what's called a prime number. So prime numbers are the numbers which are not divisible by any other number uh, other than itself and 1. And today, actually, we asked students, do you know what prime numbers are? And they all knew what, it, what, what they were. So I was, I was very impressed. It was one of those things where they didn't even have to take, uh, you know, um, ask them to raise hands. They all clearly knew what, what, what prime numbers were. And I think it was four, fourth graders already. So that was, that was impressive. But so let, let's look. Let's suppose that you have some prime number like 7, and you do arithmetic modular primes. So uh, there's one more layer to, uh, to this that I need to explain so that you could see what, uh, how this stuff is used in cryptography. Namely, you consider an equation on two variables like this. So you have two variables, x and y, and you look at an equation. And normally, you would try to solve this equation in uh, real numbers, maybe, or in, in uh, natural numbers. But let's uh, pick a prime number, like 7. But actually, in cryptography, we use very large numbers and try to solve the equation modulo that prime. So that means that we, we need to find two, num two um, um, values, x and y, such that if we substitute them into this formula, they will be equal, not on the nose, but up to a multiple of p, just like you know, 17 and 5 are the same in this new world of modular arithmetic. In the case that p is 12, but p could be some other number. So then um, we say that this equation defines what mathematicians call an elliptic curve. And elliptic curves are used in encryption, in, in cryptography. And that's where, as we learned, uh, the NSA was actually able to insert a, a backdoor by using sophisticated mathematics, so a sophisticated mathematical idea. And the key to this, the key to this application is the fact that solutions of this equation, guess what, they form a group. So this equation, you look at this equation, x and y, right, modulo prime, which I wrote, which I wrote earlier, this equation, and lo and behold, all solutions of this equation, module any prime number, also form a group, just like rotations of a round glass or a square object. They also form a group. So group is important here as well. And you use this group structure, which, uh, as I explained, group structure is the, is the fact that if you have two elements, you can produce a third. A rotation by 20 degrees plus rotation by 30 degrees gives you rotation by 50 degrees. And now, instead, you have, if you have two solutions, if you have two solutions of the equation, you can produce a third, which is like the sum of the, or, the, or the product of the two, you see? And that's a very important structure which you use for encryption as well as for uh, generating pseudo-random numbers. Pseudo-random numbers are very important because you feed them into other encryption algorithms. So if somebody could, so you, you, you have to find a way to generate them. But if somebody could break into that, generate into that, uh, pseudo-random number generator, they would be able to predict the outcome, and then they would know what is fed into the other algorithms, and then you would be able to you know, break the encryption of email messages or credit card numbers or bank accounts and so on and so forth. So that's why this, um, this is important. And it's all based, it's all predicated on, this, on, some, on a certain problem being very difficult for this group. Namely, if you have two solutions, then it's very difficult to find, to express one as another one you know, multiply it with itself many times. Even if you know that it is the case, it's very difficult to find how many times. I don't want to get into too much, too much detail, but that's basically the, the main idea. And so, just to show you how ubiquitous these elliptic curves are, here is a, from a, here is a, a small a clip from a government document, recommended elliptic curves, July 1999. Federal government recommends this elliptic curves, you see. So this stuff, Actually, great uh, uh, British mathematician, G.H. Hardy, who was a number theorist, he wrote a famous book called A Mathematician's Apology. And he was basically saying, well, people always complain that mathematics has no applications. And in fact, he was sort of like 
def uh, defying this. And he was basically saying, yes, it has no applications. We are only driven by the beauty of our subject. And we don't care about applications, right? And so it's like, number theory in which I work is useless. That was sort of his conclusion. And of course, the point is that he was right in the sense that fundamental research is not should not necessarily be driven by applications, by concrete applications. It often happens that many years later, when uh, you know, theoretical ideas find applications. But the joke was also on him, because nowadays, the kind of stuff that he worked on have become, this stuff has become ubiquitous. And even a government document back in 1999 talks about recommended elliptic curves. And um, here is another document, which was in the news lately. Uh, which was uh, in connection with the uh, NSA um, controversy, a surveillance controversy. Uh, this is from uh, National Institute of Standards Technology, which recommended the particular random number generator. So this is, imagine random numbers being generated, like in the matrix. <laughs> and so, but, and the, here, 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 this, here is the generator. It's a flow chart of this generator. And the key point is that, it, it relies on the selection of an appropriate elliptic curve and curve points specified in Appendix A1. And then we go to Appendix A1, and here it is. Here is the equation. If you didn't believe me that this equation, here's a government, it's a government document. Here's, here's the equation. And, and, this, <laughs> and this elliptic curve and this um, a random number generator is based on the fact that this elliptic curve is a group, you see. So a group, a concept which we first became familiar uh, when we talked about, um, you know, rotations of a glass and things like that. So that shows you how important the groups are in, in all of mathematics, not just in geometry. And, well, that's, a, that's the first publication in which uh, two Microsoft researchers no noted the possibility of a backdoor, which we now know was indeed inserted in this algorithm. But I don't want to get too much into too much detail. And then that led one of the companies selling those products, RSA Security, to, to, to tell their customers to stop using because... It had a back door used in which that group was used, that elliptic curve was used. Here's another example of group theory. Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, where recently um, a Higgs boson, an elusive particle, was found, as you probably all know, for which a Nobel Prize was awarded two years ago, uh, 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 to two physicists just a few months ago. That that, that, those physicists predicted this particle, the Higgs boson, uh, almost 50 years before that experimental discovery. And their prediction was based on mathematics and in part on, the, on, a, on a novel, novel applications of group theory in quantum physics. This is, what, this is an illustration of what, happens, what happened in the, in, at this large hadron collider where beams of protons were accelerated um, to a very large speed, very close to the speed of light, and then collided so that more stuff was, was coming out at very high energies. That's the way we were. Um, humanity was able to finally get a hold of that, sort of like you go and, and just kind of grab this little, the, this little uh, Higgs boson. But the way it was predicted is basically just by using uh, a pen and a piece of paper. You didn't need a $10 billion machine for that. But you needed highly sophisticated mathematics. So this brings me uh, to this uh, beautiful quote from uh, Nobel Prize winner, great physicist Richard Feynman, who said that, Basically, you know, if you don't use mathematics, you can, you can probably learn certain things. You can solve problems and so on. So we're not saying that without mathematics, you cannot do anything. But if you want to analyze reality, uh, nature, without using mathematics, from the outset, you, just, you, are set, you are settling for a reduced understanding. And we don't want our children to settle for that, right? We, don't want, we want our children to have the fullest, the best possible education, the best possible understanding of the world. And mathematics is such an important and integral part of that. This is something, by the way, also Eric and I talked to, uh, about with the students this afternoon. These are the so-called Riemann surfaces, curved shapes, which we can find all, all, all around us, and uh, which actually Einstein used this uh, theory of these curved shapes to gain new insights into the universe that turns out that our the space we live in, the space time we live in, is not flat the way we usually we imagine, uh, people imagine for thousands of years, but actually may be curved like this uh, depiction of a three-dimensional sphere. And maybe there's one thing to say about this picture that we haven't said before, which is that this picture, in some sense, represents the only, almost the only visualizable example we have of where mathematicians now bring all of these concepts of topology, that is shapes, 
symmetries, algebra, and analysis together to do calculus in the modern context. And it's almost the only visual picture we have of the modern context in which we do uh, the version of calculus that's most relevant to everything we know about the physical universe. And when the physicists found out about this picture in the mid-1970s, uh, they couldn't believe that something this pure had been discovered by the mathematicians with no um, right. direct connection to the physical universe. That's right. Universe. And so the, uh, our world may well be more, more like that picture than the flat Euclidean space that we usually imagine. And in fact, uh, what Eric was just saying, um, the, this theory that Einstein used to gain insights and understand into the world and understand that our space could be curved was based on a work by a mathematician, Bernard Riemann, which was done 60 years before Einstein. With, and it actually was done without thinking of any applications to the, to the physical reality. It was done within the narrative of mathematics. But it's sort of, it was the right mathematics for physics, but that was discovered much later. Right? So, so in, it is in this sense that one could say that mathematics enables us to transcend our limited visual imagination. I mean, let's, let's face it, we live you know, in a three-dimensional space. At least, well, physicists tell us that maybe there are more dimensions, but we can't really see them. So three, but if you're a mathematician, there are no bounds. You're not forced, you're not, you don't have to con live in a three-dimensional world. You can create your own worlds. You can create worlds like this. You, know? you can create, create and analyze and study worlds like this. And you don't have to draw them. There are methods and tools in mathematics which enable you to connect to get in touch, to live in those worlds. And that's what we want our children to be able to do. And if you're married to a mathematician, you know that this is absolutely true, because when we disappear, we go someplace like this. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Darwin, in fact, Charles Darwin, the great Charles Darwin said, you know, in his autobiography, he was lamenting the fact that he did not study mathematics well enough. I guess he didn't have good teachers, which unfortunately is the problem for most of us. Um, but he said, you know, um, I re deeply regretted that they didn't go far enough to understand mathematics. For men thus in doubt seem to have an extra sense. And please understand, I'm not saying that to kind of like, to show off and say, look, I have an extra sense. Yeah. Eric has an extra sense and you don't. On the contrary, everyone can have that extra sense because mathematics belongs to everybody. The reason why some of us don't feel that they have that extra sense is because they never had a chance to see that, they never had a chance to learn because it was not taught to them. And it is our duty to give our children to have the opportunity to have that extra sense. So here's a man who has an extra sense. Um, Robert Langlands is a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton where he actually occupies the office of Albert Einstein. And uh, he, Eric mentioned earlier his groundbreaking work uh, starting in the late 60s, which gave birth to what we now know as the Langlands program. And um, in my book, Lab and Math, I talk a lot about the Langlands program, and I have had a chance to collaborate with Einstein, with Einstein, with the new Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Freudian slip. But I, I used to, <laughs> I used to, you know, I, I, since I worked with him, I, I have been to that office and sort of always pinching myself that. Uh, and someone asked me, like, did you feel the ghost of Einstein present? And maybe, I guess in some ways, maybe he was there. I don't know. So, um, so I wanna, I, I, I'm, I'm about to wrap this up, but I wanted to emphasize this one thing which I already kind of alluded to, which is this inherent democracy of mathematics. Um, I think there is something to be said about how badly we, you know, uh, we mathematicians, how badly we communicate mathematics to the, to the public and that we're not doing nearly enough to educate people and to open the doors to this marvelous universe. Um, but actually, mathematics itself is, has this inherent democracy because no one, can, no one can patent a mathematical formula, for example. You know, Einstein's famous formula, everybody knows, equals mc squared. He couldn't say it's mine. I'm not going to give it to you. And actually, the United States Supreme Court had, uh, had a, in a landmark decision actually said that uh, mathematical truths belong to all of us because they express something about the world. And, and if it's true, then it belongs to all of us. So that's this remarkable uh, quality of mathematical knowledge. Uh, and also the fact that it applies equally to everybody. Pythagoras' theorem meant the same thing to Pythagoras 2,500 years ago as it means to us today. And there's no doubt 2,500 years from now, it will mean the same thing. 
And when I say it means to us today, not just here, but anywhere in the world, right? There are very few things in the world which, are, which have this sort of staying power, but also has this universal character and objectivity. There is actually more, I think, because, you know, um, mathematical truths are inevitable, necessary truths. Um, you know, if Leo Tolstoy hadn't lived, we wouldn't have Anna Karenina, which I, I'm sure many of you have enjoyed, at least in the movie, in the movie form. And uh, since I come from Russia, I have to mention my comp famous compatriot. Uh, but if, you know, so there's no reason to believe that someone else would write exactly the same novel. But if Pythagoras had not lived, of course someone else would have come up with, with the Pythagoras theorem. We don't know, it would be named after, it would, be, it would have a different name, but the essence would be, would be the same. And so, mathematical truths are persistent, timeless, and necessary truths. And they, I argue in my book that, look, they unite us all. This mathematics is a great connector. It's something that we can all hold on to, and through which we can connect to each other, and through which we can love each other. That's why my book is called Love and Math. That's the, sort of the argument that I make. There is really nothing in the world, if you think about it, is so profound and yet so available. Available, but... So we have to go and grab it, or at least we have to give the opportunity to our children to go out and grab it and have it and take ownership of it, because it belongs to them. So, and uh, I, uh, uh, speaking of children, I, you know, a friend of mine who's a, who's a writer, um, writes poetry books for children, he wrote, uh, he told me that when he writes a poem for, uh, for children, he feels like it's similar to doing a mathematical problem because he says you have to, you cannot lie to children. They'll call your bluff and they'll, they'll call your lie. And uh, so you have to be rigorous and precise. And I thought about it and it's true. But I think one can turn this around and to say that when we connect to mathematics, we are sort of connecting to our inner child also. That we suddenly, we can be, you know, as we grow up, we, our minds become cluttered with all kinds of things and preconceptions, prejudices and things like that, uh, misconceptions, misunderstandings. But mathematics doesn't lie. Mathematics stays the same. Mathematics sets us straight and kind of, to borrow you know, William Blake's words, helps us to cleanse the doors of perception. That's what mathematics is about. And uh, Newton put it very beautifully. He said, to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself and now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. And so my dream is that all of us, and especially our children, will awaken to this hidden reality. And then we kind of all be on the seashore playing with these things and uh, cherishing and this beauty and power that is mathematics. Thank you very much. And Ed and I have been doing this a few times, and I never tell Ed what the questions are. Uh, but the, the danger, of course, is that if he doesn't like them, he's very capable of turning them back on me. So <laughs> here goes nothing. Um, so Ed, this is insane, right? I mean, how is it that we have these concepts that these kids are ready for? Our entire reality is riding on top of these concepts, which is, I think, what you're telling me about the RSA and the, uh, and the NSA uh, encryption issue. And we don't even know that, uh, that our lives are depending on these abstract concepts. What would you say might be the three most important ideas that we could push into the curriculum of a K through eight or K through 12 school that would get our kids uh, access to the secret museum that uh, you and your professor friend seem to have, uh, you're keeping for yourself as this private right. silo where all the great stuff is stored. How do we? Uh, how do we think about that? What are three things that we might be able to, to sneak out of the silo and get into a, a school like this? Very good. So before I answer this, actually, because you mentioned the word museum, and I would like to say something, because I'm very happy that here in the audience today there are co executive co-directors of Museum of Mathematics. Do you guys know about this museum? Uh, Cindy Lawrence and Glenn Whitney, you guys, Let's stand please up. stand up. So I was, um, I was uh, very uh, fortunate to give a presentation at the Museum of Mathematics, which by the way, it is on 26th Street, just above um, Madison Square Park. Uh, and uh, I had an opportunity to speak there on Friday. And then I visited the museum and Glenn uh, was very kind to show me around. And I was really, really impressed. I think they're, they're doing an amazing job 
showing exactly what I was talking about and what Eric just asked me. How do we push these ideas out? So that's what these guys are doing. So I highly recommend all of you to go, if you haven't done it already, to go and visit this museum. By the way, some of the props which we have on the table, I bought at the, at the museum on Saturday. Some of them Eric got, but some of them I got at the museum. So, so really a, a fantastic resource now we have. And this is the National Museum of Math, right? And this is the only Museum of Mathematics in the United States so far. Whereas you said in Germany there are five, right? Seven. Seven. So that's where we are. That's where we are, and that's such a great, uh, such a you know sad you know t uh, indic indication and indicator of where we are in terms of math education in this country. But it's so wonderful that they are doing this amazing job, and they only opened the museum what uh, just over a year ago, and already I saw how many you know so many kids there with their parents and so excited. And and again, they actually show very beautiful things in geometry. Actually, a lot of things related to group theory as well, and so on. So concepts which again the kind of concepts that kids don't get exposed to at school. That's why it's such a wonderful resource. But going back to your question, Eric, three things. OK. So I would say. I want these to be Googleable search. Googleable. Yeah. OK. Topological data analysis. Whoa, I did not see that coming. <laughs> so, so there is a topology is a subject which we talked about uh, today with the kids. And it has, it's related to these geometric shapes that I showed you, like the torus and and uh, this three-dimensional sphere and so on. But uh, in recent years, uh, mathematicians realized that actually um, these methods of topology, which again, at, at the outset, look very abstract and very you know, um, complicated and sort of no, not bearing any connection to the real world, actually those methods could be used for an analysis of big data. And now there are, this is actually being done. Uh, there are products now created by using these very sophisticated methods. That would be one. Another one, of course, I want to mention mathematical statistics, which I think is crucial to, uh, to our society. Understanding of mathematical statistics is crucial for us in terms of... Um, Even if we disguise it as big data? Well, but it's, it, I, now I'm talking more about just the sense of what statistic means. Okay. You know? So I'll give you an example. Uh, when we had a presidential election, there was a lot of discussion on, you know, the, uh, different pundits would go on the air and they would say, uh, the election is a toss-up. It's impossible to predict. It's 50-50, right? And then there was one guy, um, Nate. Nate Silver, who had a blog in the New York Times where he predicted every state, who would win in every state. Uh, how did he do it? Was he a magician? No, he was a mathematician, right? And so, mathematician. And he was using, <laughs> he was using very uh, basic methods of statistics he, he used poll, polling data, right, which was available to, to everyone. And, but he analyzed polling data, and he was looking at the past performances of different polls. So say one poll would be, you know, uh, would have a systematic error in one way, another one would a systematic error in another way. And he would adjust and correct, and, and then he would combine all of this, and he was able to come up with a result. So this is your idea about a minority of one can outvote everyone else. That's right. So they were saying 50-50. And that's a great uh, example of a misconception about mathematics. I think a lot of people, if you ask them, what are the odds? If there are two outcomes, a lot of people would say 50-50. But that's only true if you think about it. It's only true if the, we don't have any information at all about those outcomes. Then, of course, it's reasonable to say 50-50. Right. But once you, but of course, in the case of an election, we have plenty of information, we have plenty of data because we have polling, have a lot of polls, and the polling com each polling company has done polls before, so right. there's like past history and so on. So we analyze and right, and so um, you have to correct your initial, um, you know, perception, which is uninformed. 50-50, and using this data, and then it becomes not 50-50, but could become 100 to 0, or 99 to 1, you know what I mean? All so, right. so that's just the sense, I think, of how statistic works. Or for example, you know, if you, there are standard questions that you can ask, for example, that if you have a group of people, you say, what are the chances that two people in this group would have the same birthday? And uh, most people are wildly off, they think that's, because you kind of think, um, you know, that you would, you would need to have, you know, 365 days, so you, maybe half, you would have to have 183 people so that you would have probability one half, but actually only 20 people. Well, and that's, so things like that. So I think that's... So can, can we take group theory, which you concentrated on? Yes. Can we broaden topological d data analysis to topology? Topology. All right. And, and then statistics. A, and statistics. And yes. one of the things that, you know, I, I just never knew was that something like statistics would actually be linked to geometry mm -hmm. because you have something like a covariance matrix which can be reinterpreted as uh, 
giving us lengths and angles just the way we Einstein used to curve space and time. And so right. very often, if you go through any particular door, uh, you wind up in a neighboring field. And for example, you know, you and uh, Apia uh, have done a very interesting work on applying um, gauge theory, which is actually something which is sort of, I would say, kind of a, you get the gauge theory if you marry sort of geometry and group theory in some sense, right? Well, like your picture. That's right. Yeah. So gauge theory is this very important topic and uh, subject in mathematics, and you guys were able to apply this to uh, the theory of um, inflation and uh, for finding the right measurement for inflation, consumer price index. And this is something which is not just, bec you know, I was talking about NSA and so on, it's, it's in the news, but CP, uh, the consumer price index, CPI, is not just in the news, it's something that we can feel in our wallet because according to CPI, our, you know, the tax brackets move according to CPI, so our taxes change, our social, uh, social benefits change, like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. So this is something which is very much a, a real issue. And uh, the problem of calculating this index uh, has stopped economists for many, many years. And I think that you guys have this sort of groundbreaking ideas which could help us finally to get to the bottom of it. And th that was a complete accident that P and I were sort of having a fight which was better mathematics or economics than we realized that we were studying the same object, but we just had two different names for it and nobody saw the application to begin with. So, you know, the, the, these things can come out of nowhere and it's entirely possible that our kids might make a research contribution when they think that they're just knocking around trying to find out new concepts. Right. Let me ask you a few other questions. Um, if I understood you correctly, are you telling me that somebody in a garage in Kazakhstan might do some work in number theory and suddenly all of our love letters and uh, our Bitcoin wallets have become completely vulnerable because I'm not sure which is worse, by the way. <laughs> 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 I think I know. Love letters or bit, yeah. Well, I know you're, you're a more practical man. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. You would yeah. say Bitcoin is more. I am more romantic. I would be so upset if somebody le read my love but, letters. Uh, Especially in Kazakhstan, like Borat, for example. You know? <laughs> it's like, oh, very nice, I like. <laughs> but is it possible that one person could make an ad advance and suddenly all of our encryption uh, is put at risk? Yes, it is possible. And so, and actually, um, recently I looked into, you know, I, I did a video. Um, with um, um, a, there's a YouTube channel called Number File, which actually puts out fantastic videos, actually suitable for the kids. Talk about numbers, but not just numbers, but many interesting things in mathematics. And they asked me to explain uh, what kind of mathematics went into this back door with the oh, yeah, curves the, and so on. How many views are you at on this thing? And now I think it's more than half a million uh, views after only a month. It's so amazing. it's a, really a lot of people are interested about it. And I think in part it's, it's not because I know something that nobody else knows. It's just that. Professional mathematicians are not doing a good job explaining this. So, so I, I just had the opportunity to explain it in this way, and everybody, you know, a lot of people just devour this. By the way, if you're not going to plug your, your book, which uh, I think you're being way too modest, this book is an amazing index to much of the world's greatest mathematics. And there's tons of stuff in it as a professional mathematician I had no idea of. And so I've been using this not, I don't expect to understand everything on every page, but there's a great pointer throughout the book to all sorts of concepts that you'd never know even existed. And so if you're somebody who finds this general area interesting, I think you'll find it uh, an amazing index to all the best uh, of mathematics. Let me ask one or two more and then I'll throw it open. So, but to, to just finish on that, uh, on sure. that topic that uh, I was asked by the interviewer in that video, um, so what should we do then to prevent this kind of things from happening? And I said, well, we should try to create encryption systems which cannot be broken. And, uh, and then people are really wondering, uh, is it possible? So well, actually there is this idea of quantum encryption where oh, yeah. you use some really uh, amazing things in the quantum world. Things that, for example, uh, the fact that when you observe a particle, you kind of change its state. So uh, you can use that. This hasn't yet been implemented commercially, but who knows, maybe this, this kind of thing will work. And the idea is that you, when you transmit things, you transmit them through by using this, this, par this uh, you know, quantum particles. And if somebody's eavesdropping, that they would necessarily be changing the states of those particles. So you would know, you see. So it's kind of a very interesting idea. And so maybe that would be a way to counter those kids from Kazakhstan, you know, by using quantum encryption. Yeah, I don't want to single Kazakhstan out in case this goes <laughs> viral. No, because of Borat, because, Bora, because, of, because we like Borat so much. Uh, of course. Um, let me ask you, before I asked you, would you rather, uh, when we were doing this, would you rather go to Mars? Uh, safely and return home or know the secrets to the Langlands program and you completely poo-pooed the question. Obviously Langlands would be far more interesting than Mars. 
which I had no idea you were going to say that. So I'm going to I'm going to soup the question up. Who cares? Would about Mars? you rather go to Mars, the Moon, <laughs> return fun. safely, and have a conversation uh, after meeting an extraterrestrial, or learn the truth about Langland theory? So I'm throwing in ET. <laughs> I mean, how passionate are you? Well, what kind of ET? You know, so <laughs> if it's a cute one <laughs> from the movie ET, you know. Then, Maybe uh, that would be tempting. This but is a family show. Ed. No, what, I know. <laughs> tell me, what do you think? I mean, is this is this math stuff actually so amazing that you'd give up meeting aliens from alternate civilizations? I mean, I'm going to keep jacking it up until we find something you care about more than mathematics. <laughs> yeah. Well, in this case, yes, for sure. I will, uh, would, would rather know the secrets of the language program. I would. Would be curious to. How about? Knowing the secrets of the language program, and maybe this will enable me to meet the aliens. All right. God willing. Um, <laughs> last question before we ask everybody to open it up. You claiming that mathematics is being treated like fence painting rather than the works of the great masters. But if we want Googleable terms, we want to know who these great masters are. So I'm going to hit you with three great masters. You have 10 seconds or less to think about who the analog is in math, and then people can go search these things mm -hmm. at home. You ready? Yes. All right. I want to know. Who's the best analog of Picasso? Robert Langlands. And why? Because, you know, uh, his works inspire us, I don't know, so <laughs> to, to, to go to the, to the, to the to new heights. And because he connected so many different things through different periods of his right. life. That's right. And Picasso actually, he, he tried to understand higher dimensions, you know, because if you know, look at your cubist paintings, the, um, what he was trying to do is he was trying to imagine what familiar objects like a guitar or something would look if you could observe them from a position of someone who lives in, in four-dimensional space. So he was actually very mathematical. Well, Dal Dali actually tried to do hypercubes and like this vision of the crucifixion, right? That's right. But he, he also used uh, catastrophe, catastrophe theory. And his, his last painting was actually based on a, on a famous um, um, you know, singularity in catastrophe theory. Okay. Yeah. Next one. Um, so you have this uh, amazing picture, Starry Nights. Who's the closest to the madness and passion of Van Gogh? Well, I have to be careful. But, uh, Kurt, Kurt Gödel, maybe? Uh, oh, because he's dead. You don't have to be that careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kurt Gödel was a visionary, and he so could see things that others couldn't, couldn't see. And um, so that's, that would be the parallel to, to, um, to Van Gogh. He, 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 just, he, understood that, uh, the, he understood that our sort of model of thinking and logical thinking and logical reasoning actually is, is very naive, that in fact the way we think is much more complex, that in any mathematical theory, in any sort of sophisticated enough system, uh, there will be true statements that we cannot prove. And this is really something which kind of throws a monkey wrench in our whole understanding of, of the world. Just the way, you know, uh, Van Gogh's paintings in reach our understanding, so did Kurt Gödel's work. Okay, I like that one. And then the last one, I need to know, uh, the versatility and depth of Michelangelo. Andre Vey. Andre Vey. Actually, no, let, let's strike that. Let me say uh, Israel yes. Gelfand. Israel Gelfand, who was one, my, one, of, the was a, one of the patriarchs yeah. of the Soviet mathematical school. And he worked in so many different fields and kind of trying to unite different ideas. And uh, the reason I'm interested in the Langlands program is because the Langlands program is sort of a grand unified theory of mathematics. And I think I learned that that the unification, the idea of unification is important from Gelfand. I wasn't his student, but I was a student of his students, so I was kind of his grand student. And there's something very interesting about Gelfand, which is relevant to this story. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, uh, but he, he ran this incredible seminar in Moscow every Monday night at 7 p.m. About 100 people would, would gather, and it was as much a social uh, gathering as it was a mathematical seminar. It would run often into, into the night, way past midnight. And so, but he was always interested in bringing in young people. And he had this, he said this thing, he, he, like, he used to say this thing, he said, at my seminar, I welcome any student from school, from any high school student, say, any high school student. Talented uh, undergraduate student, talented undergraduate students. Um, brilliant, um, you know, uh, graduate students, and only the best professors. So the, the bar was much higher <laughs> as you grow up. And he was saying, but he always accepted all the young people because he knew that they were, their minds were still uncluttered and they were still ready to, to, to get new ideas and, and, and to, to move forward. And he also knew that we needed to 
um, you know, teach our next generation. That mathematics would die if we would not teach and our students. He refused to say what his specialty was, isn't that That's right? That's right. And he was he for him mathematics was one a big live organism, and that's what he tried to instill in his students, like myself. But I think it's relevant he, to this discussion again because um, that's why I think sort of like all uh, our students are really ready for these ideas. It's us who are not ready, maybe, to convey these ideas to them. So we have to work hard. And I actually, like I said, I really thought very seriously today, preparing for. Uh, I was also thinking about this presentation, but I have to, I must admit, I was even more. Uh, anxious, you know, about the presentation for yeah, the students. Me both. I thought it was it was really something t it was a tough, tough crowd. It was very tough. And but actually, they were great, and everything went went really well. But and that's exactly the point that they are ready. It's just we may not be ready, but we we must get ready. Well, are you ready to be served up and where we don't know what's going to come from the audience and answer questions? I'm ready. So please uh, feel be fearless. Ask anything you want, and if the question uh, needs to be made a little bit more sense, I'll I'll try to hone it a little bit information has become so readily available that we don't have to even explain everything to the kids. But we, we, it's enough to just point them in the right direction. And, and my guess is that in many cases, they would be able to learn the stuff faster than we can explain it to them. That's right. We have to, we have to contend with the idea that we may be disintermediated as teachers. But we have to curate it. And so we have to make sure that they sort of go in the right direction. And when I say the right direction, there are certain fundamental canonical things, like the kind of things that we have here on the table. And one thing that's important, I think, to convey is, is that in school, the teacher is supposed to know all of school curriculum mathematics. We don't hold ourselves to the same standard as professional mathematicians. So we, Ed and I, don't know various things about various objects on this table, and we feel no guilt uh, or shame in asking somebody else, hey, do you happen to remember how this goes, or I never learned this, this aspect of this particular puzzle. So, you want to throw out the first pitch? Oh, you go. All right. Another example in terms of the platonic solids is if you think about a tetrahedron, there are four circles here and four triangles. And the idea is that you can get the colors of these things yeah. to switch because Someone, namely Chuck Haberman, figured out that you could implement the self-duality. All right, heads up in the back, Igor. Oh. Um, so pass that around, throw it up. We threw out the question to the kids today. There's an unsolved problem. Is there any way to get a mechanical system to exhibit the duality between not the tetrahedron in itself, but the dodecahedron and the icosahedron? So nobody's ever solved that puzzle. So, so far as we know, some kid at the school could be the first person to build a mechanical model of, this, of uh, the remaining two dualities among the platonic solids. So there's still new stuff to be done and low-hanging fruit. Other questions? Wait a second. We have a young man in the front. When I was doing um, a, a, a small report on photography for school, uh, to, to understand a dual with the curve of uh, algorithms and, and pseudorandom bit generators. I actually used your video not knowing. I don't know if you were going to speak. <laughs> and Great. I, and you, uh, I just wanted to say that that's what helped me understand. That's really, um, if, if I pick one thing to help me understand, help me understand encryption 10 times better, it was that video. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. In, in mathematics, is there, um, I guess in general, in mathematics, is there such thing as a truly random number? Everything's predictable if you know everything that came before it. Great, uh, great question. Well, I mean, if you, for example, you flip a coin, and if it's a perfect coin, then you would get this way uh, uh, a sequence of random numbers. So in principle, they are, they, they do exist, I think. But um, the sort of the way, the reliable way to generate those, uh, those um, random numbers would have to ha involve some physical process, like flipping a coin. So where it becomes more murky is if you want to do it on a computer. In the old days, our art was about depicting something that you saw. So you're kind of like copying things on the, on the canvas. But later on, uh, artists kind of were able to reach higher levels of abstraction. And, uh, and so they would speak not just, would appeal just, not just to the sort of the vi visual image, but would, would appeal to our emotions. And kind of art becomes multidimensional. And so, and, and so there's this parallel between the two, but also I think one can learn from the other. So when I gave a presentation at the Museum of Modern Art, I used some of the works by great artists like um, Marcel Duchamp and, and Bruce Nauman and Terry Winters to illustrate 
this infinite possibilities of interaction between math and art where it's not just we're not just copying from one to the other it's not just an artist learns some mathematics like this hope vibration which we showed but maybe renders a hope vibration in a way that would make a mathematician like myself say wow I've never seen that before and yeah. it's also hidden in places you'd never imagine for example the reason you have 12 tones uh, in an octave is that if you raise the power if you raise two which is the ratio of you know somewhere in terms of frequencies over the rainbow two to the 19th power 12th root thereof is almost exactly equal to three and it's that weird coincidence that caused us uh, to use a 12-tone system to fudge a difference between perfect ratios of frequencies and constant distance between intervals and so you may think that 12 tones is pulled out of a hat, but in, ter in fact, it comes out of a, a kind of a freak number theoretic coincidence. Right. We have it's a perfect fifth, the perfect fifth, the so-called perfect fifth. That's another way. He said, he said 2 to the 19 over 12 equals, approximately equals 3. But yep. I like to write it more, it's equivalently, because you can put this 2 here, and then you get this. It's like this. And so the seventh note is, is actually the fifth, because if you count right. And so the, the, it, it sounds so well, it's because it's precisely precise. If you, say, if you use the national anthem, oh, who say, so to go from say to land of the free, that ratio is about three. But in fact, we, we cheat, and it's just slightly less than three on a piano, but our ears can't tell the difference because the hairs in our ears are not sensitive to the difference, and we, get, we can get away with it. <laughs> is there one more question? Possible way for, to link mathematics to every other subject in the world? I mean, I understand about love. What about arts and music? <laughs> well, I don't understand about love, so I'm going to throw that one down well, here. I'm speechless, right? So I. You're on your own. That's what I was talking about. Kids understand things much faster than we can explain it to them. You know, he already got he already got the whole point, the whole point about connection to love. But now he's more he's interested. How can we connect to other areas <laughs> besides love? Well, let me tell you, young man, it's all about love. <laughs> but more seriously, um, um, I don't think there is a regular way to connect things. But, uh, but I think what's important is to realize that every time a mathematical idea made it to another uh, area of science, technology, and so on, there was a breakthrough. You know? And so uh, mathematics really underpins you know, our, all our medical advances, technology, uh, everything. And so there, there's so many examples that you can, you can think of. You know, I, just, I talked about physics, how this ideas of symmetry helped us understand the deepest structure of the universe, elementary particles, and how they interact with each other. Likewise, but there are so many areas which are still waiting for these breakthroughs. Uh, one might argue that in biology this hasn't happened yet. Maybe it has happened, but kind of like on a smaller scale. And so I'm just, I'm just so uh, anxious to see um, th this deep mathematical ideas penetrating, say, in the subject of biology and creating a revolution there. And I think it's going to happen, but I think it's, it's you and your peers who is going to do that. But our job is to give you the right tools and give you the right education so to enable you to do that. We want to make sure you've got a huge bag of tools, and then we hope that you'll go hunting and you'll let us know what you can find and bring it back to the cave and share it with all of us. So, Andrew, thanks a million for that question. It's just brilliant. Guys, uh, I hope you'll join me in uh, thanking Ed Frankel for making this beginning of the series of Jewish Success. Thank you.